Rose Carter. Rose Carter is a senior counsel with Dentons Canada and an adjunct professor with the Doster Health Ethics Centre here at the University of Alberta. She brings more than 30 years experience in the law field. She assists various healthcare providers as well as scientific professionals navigate the regulatory requirements of private and public practice. Throughout her decades of practice, Rose has appeared before all levels of court in Alberta, as well as before various administrative law tribunals. To complement her law practice, Rose devotes substantial time as an active and valuable member of the legal and medical community. She lectures on medical legal issues to faculty members, practicing physicians, residents, students, and other learners. She also serves uh, the medical communities across Canada as an executive member of the Medical Council of Canada and as a chair of its appeals committee. She's also a council member of the Royal College of Physicians of Surgeons of Canada and sits on the Aga Khan's thinking committee on stem cell research. I understand that this introduction is abbreviated. Without further ado, I pass you over to Rose. Thank you again for being here. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate uh, the introduction. So as the slide indicates, I'm privileged to speak with you today on the Health Professions Act and specifically on the section that was added to the Health Professions Act under provincial um, government bill dealing with sexual impropriety. Next. First of all, it's important to understand who is covered under the Health Professions Act. Now, the Health Professions Act covers all healthcare professionals uh, who are governed by their professional colleges in this province. Uh, the Act is focused on uh, the patient healthcare provider relationship. This slide is from uh, the HPA, and it deals with the new, relatively new addition to the HPA, which we are now seeing the results of the changes to the Health Professions Act. And I, that's the purpose of this lecture today is that I want to share with you uh, the challenges uh, with the Act. So the significant uh, part of uh, this slide is the word patient. So the Health Professions Act regulates through the colleges, gives the colleges the authority to regulate their members involving patient health care professional, not just change health care professional to a physician for the purposes of this uh, talk, and it'll save some time. So as I go through uh, the slides with you, Bear in mind that what we're talking about is to be narrowed to a physician-patient relationship. Next. So the additions to the HPA focused on focuses entirely on sexual abuse. I'm not going to read this, this full slide to you. You can read faster than I can talk. So basically, this in governs the unprofessional behavior of a physician involving his or her patient. I'll use the uh, pronoun his, but certainly uh, female physicians are not excluded uh, from this. There are allegations of sexual abuse uh, against female physicians as well as male physicians. So this slide lists uh, the various um, acts of a sexual nature that are covered under this section of the act. Next. The uh, description of the sexual act continues on this slide. And while you're reading that, I'll just uh, make note that uh, again, uh, this is an act that occurs between a patient and their healthcare provider. The act does not cover non-patients. Next slide. So if a physician 
is complained about uh, to the regulatory body. Physicians, of course, can be complained about to the college physician surgeons, nurses, to the registered nurses college, and on it goes for all healthcare providers. So if a physician is found uh, to have engaged in unprofessional conduct under this section of the HPA, the college has no, uh, no other choice but to cancel of the physician's license. Next. There are two uh, ways that, uh, two reasons why the physician's license can be canceled. One is uh, sexual abuse uh, under the HPA. And the other is sometimes what happens is healthcare providers are charged criminally uh, by the EPS, go to trial and are convicted under the college uh, rules and standards of practice, the physician must report a conviction against them to their regulatory college. So uh, once that occurs, uh, they cannot be uh, given a license or their license is pulled and it cannot uh, be granted again. And so this is a lifetime ban pursuant to the Health Professions Act. Next. This section uh, deals with uh, the legal steps that uh, a regulatory college, such as the CPSA, can take against a member and the process that's followed once a complaint is received by the college. So every complaint that comes into the college uh, needs to be investigated under, pursuant to the act. Now, investigate um, can be limited. In other words, uh, if there's a complaint against a physician, but uh, the name of the physician is incorrect. In other words, it's against uh, the patient intended to complain against Dr. X, but instead put in Dr. Y's name by mistake. Obviously, the college, uh, on realizing that, will dismiss that uh, complaint without further investigation. However, that rarely occurs, and most uh, investigations and certainly all allegations of sexual impropriety are in fully investigated uh, by the CPSA. Now, if the complaint is not dismissed before an investigation a lengthy investigation commences, and by that what I mean is beyond just reading the letter of complaint and realizing the doctor name doesn't exist or it's the wrong doctor, uh, then uh, we move into a fuller investigation. After that fuller investigation is uh, completed, the head of conduct again, pursuant to the HPA, can dismiss the complaint against that physician. If uh, the complaints director deems that uh, the complaint should not be dismissed, they have two other possibilities, one of which they can engage. One is to attempt resolution between the complainant and the physician. Under the sexual portion of the HPA, an attempted resolution is highly unlikely. The colleges in this province feel that they are under uh, severe scrutiny by the provincial government. And given the change and heightened awareness of sexual impropriety in society at large, it is highly improbable that a college will attempt to resolve the matter between the patient and the physician. So it is highly probable that uh, the complaint would result in proceeding to a full hearing. Next slide. Now, the colleges are not criminal courts. They're not civil courts. They're regulatory bodies. So they can't lay charges against their members. All they can do is accuse them of unprofessional conduct. So when a physician 
receives a notice of hearing, uh, the allegations against them would be listed under prof unprofessional conduct. Next. If, sorry, this slide's a little bit out of order, I apologize. So just going back a step, if the resolution was uh, possible, an agreement could be entered into with the physician. I just put this slide in just to show some of the things that can uh, be ordered by the college, such as courses to be taken. The physician has to have a chaperone with her and assigned costs by the college. Next. If a physician is served with a notice of hearing, and this, is a, this hearing is similar to a trial. However, instead of a judge that you would have in a criminal court proceeding or in a lawsuit, uh, the adjudicators who decide whether or not the allegations are proven against the physician consists of a hearing panel uh, on which sits physicians and a lay person or more. So if it's a college physician surgeon's hearing, there would be uh, physicians and not necessarily physicians who practice in the same area as the uh, physician accused of unprofessional conduct. Uh, but um, these physicians sitting on the panel would be um, current members of the college. Uh, the provincial government also requires under the HPA that all hearing panels uh, have lay persons on them. So these are individuals who are not physicians and uh, they sit on uh, the panels with uh, the physicians. The phys one of the physicians is usually the head, um, head of the panel. In other words, the head judge, if I can use it in layman's terms. Next. Now, this is where we get to the crux of the matter of my talk today. Let's paint this picture. So a physician has a complaint against them of sexual impropriety. Let's say having sexual intercourse with a patient. The matter is going to a hearing, not a trial. And this has vast significance from a legal point of view and certainly for the accused physician because of the results of this. So if the physician had been charged criminally and was going to a criminal trial, they would have all sorts of protections afforded them. However, what I see happening at the colleges is that they are in essence running a criminal trial under the guise of a regulatory hearing. And in the regulatory hearing, the physician does not have uh, the legal protections that are afforded uh, to them. Next slide. So this is, this is a regulatory hearing, and I just want to talk about that a little bit more. So a regulatory hearing is being adjudicated by the physician's peers, and they're what they're looking at is did the are the allegations against the physician proved on a balance of probabilities whereas if this was a criminal trial the judge or jury would have to find beyond a reasonable doubt that the physician engaged in uh, the uh, purported uh, misconduct so this is hugely significant for physicians uh, who have allegations of sexual impropriety taken to a hearing by their regulator. So I've already told you uh, one reason why it's very concerning, and that is the balance probabilities versus the um, beyond a reasonable doubt. On a balance of probabilities, it's a much lower standard and all the the panel has to decide is whether it was more probable than not that the physician engaged in the alleged uh, misconduct. In a criminal proceeding, 
the bar is much higher. It must be beyond a reasonable doubt. Point two on the slide. The physician is a compellable witness under the HPA for allega uh, defending allegations of, of uh, professional misconduct. What this means is that the physician must testify. They cannot refuse to testify. I mean, if they refuse to testify, they're going to have other charges brought against them as being ungovernable, and we today's not the day to discuss that aspect. But here, the physician must testify. In a criminal trial, the physician has the legal right to remain silent. In other words, the physician cannot be made to testify. And this is very, very significant because the person who, on whose behalf the case is being prosecuted by the Crown Prosecutor is going to testify, obviously. But the Crown has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the charges against the, um, the physician have been proven. That's a very high bar to meet. The other important difference between a regulatory hearing and a criminal trial is that hearsay evidence is allowed in a college hearing. Now, hearsay evidence is, uh, let me use an example. I'm testifying in court and I tried to tell the court that Michael or Carol told me something. That's not allowed except in very narrow circumstances, which aren't even worth mentioning in this talk. But in a regulatory hearing, all sorts of hearsay evidence is allowed in. So what I'm stressing here is that the way the system is set up for this very, very serious charge of sexual impropriety against a healthcare provider is that all the normal protections given in law in a criminal trial are not afforded here, but yet, in my opinion, these regulatory hearings are being conducted as criminal trials with the horrendous outcome of the physician losing her license if found to have occur, uh, done what she or he has been accused of. Next slide. The, as I thought about this and based on my experience in these regulatory hearings, this is almost worse for the physician than being charged criminally and going to jail, found guilty and going to jail for a couple of years. Before the HPA had these changes made or additions made to it, the physician, after being released from jail, could apply again for to be licensed. We've had instances where uh, in Canada where physicians have gone to jail for various uh, criminal offenses and have been granted license to practice medicine again. That is because in Canada, I submit, we have a belief uh, that people can be rehabilitated and they shouldn't be punished for the rest of their lives for something that they did and served a jail sentence for already. So in my humble opinion, uh, the results of this change to the Health Professions Act is worse for physicians than being charged criminally and possibly being found not guilty because the bar is quite high or even being found guilty and uh, serving their time in prison. The Health Professions Act forbids colleges to reinstate a physician's license. Next slide. The results of hearings can have huge ramifications for a physician. The reason I say that is because 
under the Health Professions Act, if a physician is found, and I use a colloquial term, guilty at a hearing by a college, the physician can appeal that finding to the college council of that professional body. And the physician must do that before being able to go to a court of law, which in our province is the court of appeal. So what can happen and what has happened in situations is that um, a regulated member goes to a hearing on a sexual allegation uh, situation is found to have engaged in unprofessional conduct by the hearing panel. The physician then uh, decides with help of his or her lawyer as to whether or not they want to appeal that decision. And most, I can't imagine a physician not wanting to do that because they're going to lose their license. So it, there's usually an appeal uh, to the regulatory body's uh, council. So now there is uh, an appeal panel, again, consisting of, uh, if it's a dental college, dentists and uh, lay people, if it's the CPSA or nursing college, it's those regulated members plus public members. The appeal can set aside uh, the hearing panel's decision. But again, given the climate that we are currently in, that is not very likely. So now the physician has spent an incredible period of time because these things can go on for a few years. And there's no, there appears to be no statute of limitations on how far back um, an accusation could is purportedly occurred. So it could have been 20 years ago, could have been 30 years ago, last week, it doesn't matter. The college is going more likely than not going to deal with the, with the allegation and go to a hearing regardless of the time of frame since the uh, purported misconduct occurred. The colleges do put on their websites the outcomes of hearings. And these can be disastrous for professionals, especially when they're appealing to the Court of Appeal and their appeal has not been heard. So what happens at the end of uh, the appeal before uh, the council appeal is that if the council upholds uh, the findings of the hearing committee, the lawyer for the physician uh, will ask for a stay to be put in place. And what that means is that uh, the loss of license, uh, the costs, significant costs assigned against the uh, regulated member, the college cannot enforce those findings against the physician until the matter has been heard by the Court of Appeal. Now, if the physician wins their case at the Court of Appeal, in other words, uh, for example, and I have a case like this, where the allegation was uh, made by a female who was not a patient. She was never a patient of uh, the um, regulated member. So um, a matter such as that goes to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal has a number of options. Uh, they can set aside uh, the finding of um, the Appeal Council and dismiss the whole matter against the physician. Uh, they can um, uphold the findings of the uh, Appeal Council panel, 
or they can send the matter back uh, to uh, the appropriate college uh, with certain directions. Going back to the publication, if a publication occurs prior to a decision by the Court of Appeal, this has the potential for serious ramifications for that member. The um, allegations, the descriptions of the alleged sexual impropriety can be uh, published. The findings against the uh, physician uh, can be uh, published. The costs um, can be mentioned. In other words, a whole summary and sometimes I think more than a summary of what the allegations of sexual impropriety involved are put on the college's website. So no matter if that occurs, quite frankly, no matter what happens at the Court of Appeal, that regulated member's reputation is irreparably damaged. So this has huge, huge ramifications uh, for regulated members of uh, uh, colleges. Next slide. And I can't stress this enough, that if allegations of sexual impropriety against a patient are found to have occurred, the patient, uh, the physician loses their license and cannot be reinstated in Alberta. I am often asked, well, what about outside of Alberta? Because this uh, provision uh, to the Health Professions Act is uh, quite new, uh, we haven't really seen any uh, actions in relation to that. In other words, based on past experience, it appears unlikely, but not impossible, that another um, college, another province, might issue a license uh, to that physician because they're not governed by the HPA. However, when a regulated member of a healthcare college is uh, moves to another province, that provincial college will ask the Alberta College uh, for a letter of standing. So in that letter of standing, for example, the CPSA would write to the BC College, for example, and say, this physician uh, was found uh, to have engaged in sexual impropriety pursuant to the Health Professions Act and has lost uh, his or her license and under the HPA, such cannot be reinstated. So it's an open question as to what uh, another college in another province might do. Remember that all colleges have in essence the same mission, which is to protect the public and serve in the public's best interest. And so it remains to be seen what would happen uh, for a physician who's lost their license in Alberta uh, whether or not they would be successful in applying in another province. Next slide. Want to address costs. So once an investigation occurs by a college, the college incurs certain costs. Outside costs would be, for example, uh, retaining a, an expert to comment on various aspects of the allegations. So the college has to pay that third party uh, monies for that opinion and for them to come and testify at a hearing. The college is also assigned costs you know, to the member for um, in-house costs. For example, uh, staff time that is spent investigating. Uh, sometimes the individual who investigates the complaint against the member is an outside company. Sometimes the investigation is done in-house. So if it's whether it's in-house or out of house, 
uh, the physician is charged with those costs if the allegations are proven against them. We have a very interesting case uh, in Alberta under the uh, from our Court of Appeal, and that's the Genwap case. It's uh, cited on the bottom of this uh, slide. Uh, Genoa case was uh, adjudicated in 2022, so about two years ago. And uh, this is all public knowledge. The case is, uh, of course, there's nothing secret about uh, legal proceedings in Canada. The um, uh, case can be found online. This case was brought to the Court of Appeal on behalf of a dentist against the Dental College here in Alberta alleging that uh, having found the member to have engaged in unprofessional conduct, the costs assigned to that member were unreasonable. And the justices of our Court of Appeal who heard the case agreed with the dentist that the costs against her were exorbitant and made uh, findings against the college in uh, that uh, regard. Uh, the case is quite lengthy, but in um, Jenna, the um, Court of Appeal made it very clear that part of uh, the dues that members pay, for example, I'm a lawyer, so I pay dues to the Law Society, and just as physicians pay dues to the college to be licensed, that part of that uh, dues that the dues that are paid should go to um, paying the costs or being apportioned to costs for um, uh, conducting hearings and investigations. So that case is very significant in Alberta. However, that case is now going to be reconsidered uh, by our Court of Appeal in March of next year. It's very uncommon for high courts like the Supreme Court of Canada or courts of appeal in the provinces and territories to reconsider an earlier decision of theirs. So we have to wait and see what's going to occur uh, in the decision that will be re rendered sometime after March 2025 as to what our court does with costs. But currently, I have a case uh, where costs are well over four hundred thousand uh, dollars to a member uh, who was uh, found to have engaged in unprofessional conduct with a non-patient, and I anticipate that by the time uh, we finish at the court of appeal, these are college costs. These are not. Uh, the fees that are being paid uh, to uh, the members' lawyers. These are costs being set by the college. And I anticipate, as I start to say, that by the time um, we get to the Court of Appeal, uh, the costs will probably be much closer to a million dollars against uh, the member if the Court of Appeal upholds uh, the findings of the uh, the appeal council against the member. Next slide. So just to stress again, I put it in a separate slide that uh, these costs can be ex exorbitant and can well bankrupt a member, especially since uh, he or she is not going to be able to practice in their healthcare uh, profession because they've lost their license pursuant to the Health Professions Act. Next slide. So um, I've already touched on this, but there's currently a dental college case uh, before the Court of Appeal. And the issue, and this is why I stressed at the beginning of my discussion with you, the word patient, because the Health Professions Act deals with patients. And this complainant against this uh, college member uh, was not a patient. 
So that's one of the issues uh, that will be before the Court of Appeal. And uh, the other one is uh, the exorbitant costs against uh, a member. Next slide. So those are my comments, and I see that I've spoken quite quickly. So we have time for questions, comments. So I would be very interested in hearing um, the thoughts of those in attendance today. 